coming up on Harvard Chan this week in health, revisiting Zika. Most likely, it is going to come back because the virus now is circulating. It's endemic. We just don't know when. More than a year after the Zika epidemic attracted global attention, we'll take a look at its lingering impact, what we've learned about the virus, and the likelihood of new cases as we enter summer in the United States. Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. It's Thursday, June 8th, 2017. I'm Amy Montemuro. And I'm Noah Levitt. Amy, it's now been more than two years since an outbreak of the Zika virus sickened a million people in dozens of countries, most notably Brazil. The epidemic began in early 2015 and was declared a public health emergency by the WHO in February 2016. Zika has been linked to microcephaly in children born to infected mothers. That's a condition where infants are born with abnormally small heads. And the virus is also believed to be responsible for a spike in adults with Guillain-Barre syndrome, a neurological disorder that can lead to paralysis and death. And while Zika is primarily mosquito-borne, research has shown that it can also be sexually transmitted. In November 2016, the WHO declared an end to that public health emergency over Zika virus. But concerns have lingered, especially in the Americas. Just this week, the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico said that the Zika epidemic there was over. Puerto Rico saw more than 40,000 cases of the virus, making it one of the hardest-hit areas worldwide. Brazil saw the most Zika infections and more than 1,000 cases of infants being born with microcephaly. And since the epidemic first began, we've gained new insight into the origins of the virus. Zika was first identified in Uganda in 1947, and new Harvard Chan research shows that the virus has actually been circulating silently and unreported on the African continent for the past two decades— highlighting that the disease can persist in humans. A separate study from a team at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard found that Zika was likely circulating in the Americas for at least a year before the outbreak began in 2015. And to get an update on Zika virus, we spoke with a Harvard Chan researcher who has spent the last couple of years studying the effects of the virus in Brazil. Marcia Castro is Associate Professor of Demography in the Department of Global Health and Population. And she told us that for the moment, there's very little Zika activity, both in the Southern Hemisphere, where summer, which is peak mosquito season, has already ended, and in the Northern Hemisphere, where summer's just beginning. In fact, Castro told us that chikungunya, another mosquito-borne illness, is a bigger issue at the moment. Still, she says that vigilance is needed because infectious disease outbreaks often ebb and flow. It's the same with dengue. So dengue, usually we have an epidemic here. Um, And then we have two or three years that it's endemic, things calm down, and then it comes back. Um, And, I mean, we have plenty of reasons to expect that Zika would be the same. And you have new susceptibles in the area that then can be infected. Uh, We have areas that were not heavily hit before, so then you have even more susceptibles there. Because the truth is, the mosquito is still around. And, And this year we have chikungunya and, you know, Two years ago, we had an outbreak of dengue. So who knows what's going to come next year? Uh, So most likely, it is going to come back because the virus now is circulating. It's endemic. We just don't know when. And so I know kind of the the, the most notable links with Zika were microcephaly and Guillain-Barre. Has our knowledge of the effects of Zika kind of evolved over time? It is the cause of effect of the congenital Zika syndrome. Microcephaly is just one of the possible manifestations. Um, we are still learning all the different health outcomes that those kids have, and that's the truth. I mean, um, the visual and hearing problems were pretty obvious in the beginning. The special type of epilepsy was obvious in the beginning, but there are other complications that we are learning now as the kids are aging. The relationship with Guillain-Barre is also, I think, pretty well established um, in several countries that had Zika before. So um, the the biology part, I think we're learning more and more, you know, how it crossed the placenta, it prefers the stem cells and, and you know, the neurocells, all of these things that we are learning. But I think that the consequences are pretty, pretty well established. Probably what we don't know is... You take a woman that got infected in week X, what is your risk? And um, one of the challenges to be able to measure this is we don't know what's the attack rate of, of Zika. We don't know how many people got infected because you have the asymptomatics. And what we need is a very nice serology test that you can go out in the field, 
test people and know if they had Zika, dengue, chikungunya, or any combination of those. And we don't have that yet. So even if somebody wants to say, I want to do a survey now and see what percentage of the population in the northeast of Brazil got infected, we don't have a very good test to do that. And that hampers our ability to really run a model and say for sure that's your risk if you are in week um, 27 and you got Zika. We, we don't have that yet. And so I know a lot of kind of resources and time had been rapidly pushed into trying to develop a Zika vaccine. Is that, is that still a goal that's, that should be pursued or is it worth kind of investing more money and building up these surveillance systems now while it's kind of dormant in a sense? Well, I guess those things should be happening concurrently. Um, it would be terrific to have a vaccine. But that said, there is all those ethical issues around the vaccines. We cannot test vaccines in pregnant women. Then the question is, would you vaccinate pregnant women? Uh, if we have those um, concerns with um, antibody-dependent enhancement, that the evidence is basically showing if you had dengue before and then you get Zika, you could have a worse infection. So what are the real implications of vaccinating, particularly the pregnant women? So. If it would be terrific to have the vaccine, but getting the vaccine, we still would have a lot of steps to move forward to be able to say, now we can go ahead and vaccinate all women, including those pregnant, and then the problem is, is done. Um, that said, we can't neglect surveillance at all because usually what happens is by the time we react, the problem is so widespread that then it it's going to take much more time to, you know, solve the problem than if you were really with a good surveillance system to pick up things in the beginning. With Zika coming on the heels of Ebola, there was a lot of talk about how this kind of exposed a lot of fundamental issues with global health systems, especially epidemic disease response. I mean, do you see that any of those concerns have been addressed or are there still major gaps that need to be filled? I think that each time we have an outbreak is going to be a different story. That's the truth because there is a, um, um, you know, there is a flavor of politics in the middle that you can never predict how those things are going to go. So Brazil, despite all the challenges and all the novelty, all the problems, they put up, put out a response. They came up with money, with resources, and you know, in the meantime, the U.S. took nine months to vote for you know the money to be used. Now Brazil is completely messy politically. If we have an outbreak, what's going to happen now? I have no idea. I don't even want to think about this because I don't think it would be good. So, you know, I don't think we have um, two responses that are the same because of that, because the people taking the decisions are different, different actors, different responses, and it could be great. It could be a disaster. Despite those concerns, Castro says there have been some encouraging responses to Zika virus in Brazil. For example, in one state, every infant born with microcephaly has been receiving care and long-term therapy. But Zika has also highlighted lingering concerns related to women's health in Brazil, where abortion is illegal and contraception is difficult to access. Castro's research has shown that despite warnings from the government that women should delay pregnancy, Brazil's birth rate remained relatively stable after the Zika outbreak. And so while now we know much more about the immediate health effects of Zika on women and infants, Castro is specifically focusing on the long-term health of those affected by Zika. One thing that has been puzzling me a lot is the, the care that the mothers also need to receive. Um, one thing is the level of depression among those mothers may be extremely high, and then there would be a demand for mental health services that they're not receiving at all. Uh, the other issue is those mothers may have other kids and those kids may be receiving less attention or less care, which means that you can impact the development of those children, the older children, and then the, the mother can end up with both kids or how many kids she has with developmental problems because of the, the inability of be giving them the attention they need. There's the other thing that is the dissolution of unions, of households, um, the lack of income because of the, all the trips you have to take to, 
you know, um, provide the care for the children. If they had to give up their jobs, we also don't know what percentage of women had to give up their jobs. So there is a lot of uh, social impacts of the epidemics that we know close to nothing. And that's one of the things that hopefully um, this summer we're going to be able to bring bring light to some of those questions and and then provide this data to the government so they can actually implement some actions that would address those those gaps. And so I know some of your research looked at the the birth rates kind of post Zika and found that there really wasn't maybe the drop in birth rates that was expected, but you did find that there were some changes with regards to how, uh, or I guess, the timing of abortion. So what have you kind of found with with regards to that when it comes to Zika and birth rates, abortions, contraception? Yeah, so um, one of the challenges in doing this work is that because abortion is not uh, legal in Brazil, with rare exceptions, we don't have data on that. Uh, what we have is um, women that show up in a hospital with a complication due to an abortion, be it voluntary or um, um, induced, and we can use that data as a proxy of um, problems that are happening because of an abortion. And there are ways that you can use that data to estimate unsafe abortion. So I'm using that data as a proxy to see, do we observe more women showing up at a hospital because um, of a complication uh, of an abortion? And um, the other thing is I have a long time series of monthly births by states um, in Brazil. So we look at that as well. And I look at the fetal deaths. So do we see an increase in fetal deaths because of, of Zika? So fetal deaths basically doesn't change at all. That's one thing we saw regardless of the state. Um, the number of births, um, what I observe is there is indeed a lower than forecasted number of births. And up to a certain month, it's still within the confidence interval. And w once we start reaching um, September, October 2016, what we're forecasting is significantly lower. And now I'm kind of finalizing, quantifying how, how much lower this really is, in which states this is more significant. And then for some states, what we observe is when you relate the time series of births and the time series of abortions, there is a lag between those series because the conception happened at a certain point, and if you go full term, you deliver, and within the usually the first trimester, there is an abortion. So if you try to see what's the lag that brings those series together, um, for some states, um, it seems that after the Zika outbreak, the lag is earlier, meaning that women would have abortions earlier than the usual, and in some states it's later. Um, now, in fact, this could really go either way. So either you have an infection or you are just afraid that you might have had an infection and you can have an abortion, or you were, let's say, you're beyond the first trimester and then you had a rash or you had an ultrasound that shows a problem and then you decide to have um, an abortion. So um, th so that's the one thing that we're seeing. For some states, there's no difference, but for some, and, and particularly the ones that we're seeing some difference are states that were hit by, by Zika. So, so now we're putting all this together, uh, but I think we have at least some initial evidence that there is something going on. Uh, what is driving this? If it's postponing pregnancies, abortion, whatever the reason, we cannot nail down. But certainly there is some sort of behavior response in terms of conception that is um, producing a lower number of births than um, we would expect. Do you think in some sense the risk perception was lower in Brazil when it should have been higher, and maybe it was higher in the U.S. when the risk perception could have been lower? I think the risk perception was was high at the time that everything was in the news. But the catch is uh, Zika, like dengue or any of those uh, vector-borne diseases, they have a, a, a seasonality. So when it's in the news... Uh, especially with Zika. So when all those kids are being born, remember those kids were infected months earlier. So by the time that kids are not being born, it's probably when you are in the high season 
for infection, and now you think you don't have a problem. So there is a there is a lag time, and it's it's cruel in that sense because by the time you are very afraid, you know it's probably transmission is going down, but then all those babies are being born. And that's one of the problems with Zika, is that the perception is connected to what's in the news, but that not does not necessarily match with the psych, with the season of the disease, um, which is pretty much the reason why they were so afraid about the Olympics, right? But again, the season during the Olympics was the low season, and sure enough, we had zero cases. But th that's the disconnect. And when you're building your perception, you don't take that into account because a lot of people don't even know you have a seasonality. And so you mentioned the seasonality, and so obviously here in the U.S., we are heading into that summertime when it is it is kind of the high time for mosquito-borne illnesses of, of all varieties. So, I mean, should there be a high, higher level of concern in the U.S.? I mean, do you see states, especially Florida, I mean, territories like Puerto Rico, do you see them already kind of taking action now to prepare for maybe an inc maybe a increasing cases? Yeah, so your best bet in intensifying vector control is exactly before the peak. Um, I don't think Puerto Rico is going to be an issue because the infection was so widespread that I don't think you have enough susceptibles to have another major outbreak. But you take places like in Florida, in Texas, and you know, you could have a small outbreak. So if you intensify now in, you know, doing everything. You use larvicides, you try to destroy some of those places that are, you know, um, having breeding habitats, you sort of modify the environment. So if you do now before it really picks up, that's your best bet. The takeaway message from Castro, in order to prevent Zika virus, the time to take action is now when the virus is largely dormant. And that takes the form of mosquito control, which can start in the home. Castro says we should all take action to remove breeding grounds for mosquito larvae, such as eliminating standing water in our yards or monitoring appliances, such as refrigerators or air conditioners, where water can pool. And if you want to learn more about Zika virus prevention, we'll have some more information and links to resources on our website, hsph.me slash thisweekinhealth. And that's all for this week's episode. A reminder that you can listen anytime by subscribing on iTunes or Stitcher or find us at soundcloud.com slash harvardpublichealth.